Yeah. Hey everybody, good morning. As Jesse said, my name is Ron Winward. I am security evangelist for the Americas for Radware. And um, before joining Radware, I was at Server Central and NLayer for a long time. And prior to that, data side of CLEC business. So um, we are going to talk today about, about Mirai. Um, I'm not a Mirai researcher, or um, I'm not a, uh, actually in the research function at all at Radware, but um, Mirai, as one of my researchers said, became the celebrity of botnets. So, um, you know, a lot of us are aware of it, uh, obviously with what happened in the news. Um, and so I wanted to say, you know, look at the attributes that you know, everybody says it's, you can self-install it and, and anybody can set it up and run it and there's this whole infectable thing of, of uh, IoT devices that we can just gain access to and, and take under control. And I was interested in that. So let's look at this as maybe one man's study of, of Mirai. Um, I wanted to focus specifically on the network attacks because as a networker that was interesting to me, what it's doing um, uh, to our networks and maybe look at how we can uh, prepare for, for some of these. Um, so again, what this is, this is looking at the structure itself, the components, the attack vectors that are included in code. Um, with a focus on the network attributes. This is not a code review. I'm not a code guy. Uh, and this is not a how-to guide. You know, I'll talk a little bit about some of the steps that I took to get things uh, up and running, but um, you know, it's, uh, that's not what we're going to focus on today. Uh, so just to, we have to kind of start out with a quick recap. You know, uh, at the end of September, the threat actor named Anna Senpai released, um, a posted on hackforums.net about what was happening. Uh, hey, everybody, here is my botnet. Uh, you might have heard about it with the uh, Krebs attack and, and um, um, you know, the, the recent news. I'm getting out of the business. Here's my code. Uh, and a lot of people were interested in that. Uh, a, immediate, the immediate response is, why would somebody do this? And you know, the obvious answer is probably attribution. If, if everybody has the code, then not one person can be you know, uh, easily tied to the code. Um, but Brian Krebs has, has a theory, too, of who this is. So um, some users were doubting the authenticity of this person. But um, you know, it's a, uh, the person on hack forums has, has pretty good reputation and you know, has a, um, a strong history of, of who they are, so perhaps. Um, this is a pretty cool animation de designed by my colleague Pascal in, in, uh, in He's my counterpart in the EMEA region. But he, it's a good display of, of uh, how this all happens. So um, a threat actor, Anna Senpai, or perhaps somebody that looks like uh, uh, Walter White's Heisenberg character, if you're familiar with that, um, sets up a, a, a scan listen server and a command and control server. Um, and that's how this all really starts. And there, there can be many different physical servers, or, or this can be distributed across them. But these are the two main components. Uh, on the CNC server, uh, you can launch the actual first bot. Um, he has a little bit of a different behavior than the infected bots, but this is the guy who is going to start the chain reaction, right? So then once a bot is infected, um, the bot immediately, and I'll show examples of this, starts his own um, scanning, port scanning on 23 and 2323, um, trying to find immediate uh, hosts that he can infect. And if he finds one, uh, as we can see the, this guy on the bottom right, um, he reports to the scan listen server, and he reports what IP addresses worked, uh, what credentials worked, and then the scan listen server says, is this, is this guy uh, something I know about? Uh, if he is, don't worry about him. If he isn't, I'm going to start the loader. Now, the loader is going to start loading code, initiating commands onto the bot. Bot gets infected. Process continues. He reports back to CNC and uh, continues in his own um, port scans and, and, and brute forces. Now, there's another interesting attribute to this, and that is adding access to the botnet. So somebody says, hey, guy who owns the botnet, I will pay you for access to your botnet. Or maybe it's the other way around. But there's a monetary ability to lease uh, these. And in fact, there, um, uh, you can assign resources and in fact set up a, an API uh, to control it as well. So that's a, a high level overview. Um, we're going to get into the guts of it today. Um, this is, you know, I talked about the, the brute force uh, login attempts that happen. Um, out of the box or out of the, the straight code, which you can download on GitHub, uh, there are 60 
default username and passwords uh, that are available out here. And this is just a blow up of, of, of some of these. Um, this is completely configurable. You can add your own. Uh, you, can, you can do whatever you'd like with these. Uh, there are um, nine attack vectors that are out of the box. Uh, one of them is, is commented out, and one of them is broken. Um, Ten, maybe? Um, and we're going to go through all of these that, uh, that, that uh, are included. Uh, most interesting to me, and I think had a lot of, of uh, notoriety in the recent attacks, um, the DNS water torture. Uh, this is a, a one that I have experience with before joining Radware even, uh, defending, and it's, it's a pretty interesting attack. I, I enjoyed this process of discovery because I learned a whole lot more about it, but I think that this was highly involved in the, in the uh, DNS attacks that we saw um, you know, against our, our friends at Dyn. Um, there are some interesting, as I was diving through the code, there are some interesting things that are in here. Uh, we'll call them Easter eggs. I was going through this, and here's something called a safe string. So uh, obviously, it's a URL. I want to go in and see what this is. Ah, it's a Rickroll. Uh, so thank you, Anna Senpai. Um, the other thing that was up here, uh, pretty neat, uh, if you plug this, uh, the prompt into Google Translate, it says, I love chicken nuggets. Um, you can really have this say anything you want, but I thought it was a little bit funny. Um, so this is my lab architecture, and um, you know, don't pay so much attention to the tiny little IP addresses that are in here. I can get this to you, or if it, this is being uh, recorded, I believe, so you could probably pause this if you want to see some of this. But um, my uh, my lab network. Um, basically, what I have here is my um, just an internet router here. And I had this segmented off. So this is my test uh, router here. Um, I set up um, a couple of VMs in ESXi. One of them is kind of a bastion host, a utility host. He gives me screen access to, to, you know, to run screen and, and, and access the other hosts. He's serving files locally for me, scripts, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, because so much of this is based on DNS, I wanted, and I wanted to keep it internally, I set up my own uh, bind server as well on the network, so that, uh, and I gave it a, a, a management uh, interface and a test or a lab interface, so that I could serve DNS locally and give it updates, and anything that also needed real queries, I could, I could do that too. Um, but most importantly, the command and control server is, is on here. He's running on a very lightweight VM, uh, running on Debian, uh, also the scan listen server. He's he's running on Debian as well, and these guys are contained in a VM. Now, one thing I found is that when we're running them in a VM, um, and you're using the initial bot uh, that comes as part of or that you can launch from the command and control server, he can fill your uplink capacity here. So you know we uh, we look to to things that are outside of the uh, the VM because then maybe we we lose access to all these other things, but. Um, Another thing I thought was that I'm going to set up another IoT bot um, out here and put him on 192.168.2 slash 24. Uh, this guy, bot2, was a uh, Raspberry Pi, and he was just running Raspbian. Uh, I wanted to see what would happen uh, with him. And then here, 192.168.3 is my attack network. So I have a, uh, actually, I put a Linksys up here because, and I'll talk about this uh, in a little bit, but. He's just there. I have him actually plugged in on the LAN side of this for a couple reasons. Um, he's serving DHCP. He's uh, serving DNS uh, to anything that is offering DHCP. Uh, I have my cameras here, so I'll talk about this guy. And then the target that I was attacking, he's just a, uh, an Ubuntu machine running uh, uh, Apache, and uh, he's also doing some packet sniffing for me as well. So that's what it looks like. Um, as part of the code, as you see, I was doing 1918 space. Um, by default, the code blocks a lot of these, uh, these prefixes, and here are the ones that it, that it blocks. Um, most of these are not announced. Some of them are now announced, but as we can see you know, in the blue line, my 1918 space uh, is being excluded by scans. So obviously, I had to make some changes there. Uh, these bottom guys are DoD networks. Um, why are some of these excluded? I would, my first guess is that these are a lot of prefixes to scan. If they're not announced, why waste the scanning resources on the bots, right? There are some other interesting ideas, specifically with these ones that are not announced. Um, 
you know, why would you want uh, to, would you want to make sure that these aren't being scanned? Maybe you exclude it from the code. Uh, so anyway, so I changed my code. So in the code here, um, I have basically gone and said for all these, O1 is like first octet. So skip, um, you know, I've, I've omitted a lot of these from my screenshot, but skip 190, 191. And then I have it drilled down to basically say, I only want you to scan 192, 168, 3 slash 24. And the reason for that is I uh, don't have, uh, I didn't want to let it just scan all these things that I wasn't interested in, right? Um, <clears throat> Components of the bot, we have a lot of different processes that we have to start. Um, the initial bot, as we start it, um, we have to enable some code. We have to comment out something in code that says, uh, I'm going to allow you to be a bot, but I also want you to start the scanning process. So uh, I've done that in this example. Here we can see that the scanning process oops, is started. Uh, and then this is what the scanning process looks like. So very quickly, I've got all of these IP addresses that I'm scanning from, in this case, my bot. 192.168.2.14. Um, and as you can see, he's scanning all of these IPs with 23. And here's an example of 2323. 23. Uh, so immediately out of the box, he's, he's, uh, he's begun his process. So once he finds somebody, here's an example of um, the bot finding an IP address, 192.168.3.2, which in this case was my, was my Linksys running tomato. Um, he tries to log in, right? So we can see examples based from that list of 60 user and, and passwords. Uh, here's my username that I try. Here's my password. Here's my username, password, username, password, root, no password. So he, he, he tries the, the, the brute process. This, without timestamps, looks like it's a quick thing. It's actually not a quick thing. Um, and it's very random. So I would have um, thought immediately that the bot, once it found something, he would just target and poke and poke and poke and poke and poke. That doesn't seem to be the case. You might try one, uh, and then it might not hit that node again for another five minutes and try another password. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of a random process, um, it seems to be anyway. When I was running it, I thought, oh, this is going to take some time. And then I thought, well, if you have 100,000 bots doing this, you're maybe a little bit more efficient, even if it's not you know, one bot, you know, truly brooding, you know, the, the target. Uh, I didn't do too much with this, but this is the scan listen process that which you have to start. He listens uh, out of default on uh, TCP 48101. Uh, and this is the guy who's listening for the reporting of what's working out in the network. Uh, the loader process, uh, I will give an, a, another good example of this that I'm forcing, but the loader process, his job is to keep track um, of the bot loading. So you can see uh, in here uh, how are things loaded, and I'll give you examples of this. The two primary ways are wgets um, uh, from the bot itself and then TFTP as well. Um, and it allows for uh, piping in uh, a list of IP addresses to, um, uh, the, uh, to the loading process. So I'll get, that's how I mainly did this stuff. So I talked about my Linksys. So as I'm setting this up, I'm thinking, ah, oh, this IoT botnet, it infects everything. This, this shouldn't be too hard, right? So um, <clears throat> I'm thinking back. I remembered I had a, a Linksys at home uh, in the basement, and I remembered that these WRT54Gs, they run some Linux. Um, and then uh, I thought, well, they're probably running busy, uh, BusyBox, too. Remember that Mirai infects BusyBox. So sure enough, I get into this guy. And I take a look, and um, uh, I log in. And uh, he's, you can see he's running Tomato, and he's running BusyBox. And I'm thinking, this is going to be great, right? Not the case. Um, I think the reason for this is um, the, the binaries and the architecture code that is included with these guys. I, don't think, I think that this guy has a Broadcom chip, and I don't think that, um, that the code includes these. But I also found in other examples that this isn't as easy as it initially sounds. <coughs> So I'm thinking, OK, well, this is an IoT botnet camera, uh, a, a camera botnet. So I go to Amazon, and I quickly order one of the cameras that uh, it looks cheap and I think is one of the, the names that is uh, potentially included. Didn't work. So I'm thinking, all right, well, what I can probably do is go to uh, Micro Center and get uh, they got cameras there, so I'll go there. Uh, I got one there. Didn't work. Another one. Didn't work. So. For what it's worth, uh, not everything is infectable. <laughs> but I found one. Um, here is a, a Shriekam AP003. 
Um, uh, I, after tr forgetting about my blind luck, I just went to actually find one that, I, that was a known issue. So this is the guy that I got. Um, he is, uh, as you can see, here's an end map of the, um, of, uh, the services that are running on here. I'm most interested in Telnet, obviously. So I Telnet into him, um, and I see, knowing what the username and password are, that I can get into him, and he runs BusyBox. So I'm thinking, great, I've, I've got my, my guy here. Uh, and in fact, I did. He was, uh, he was the bot that I used for my, the IoT bot that I used for uh, the rest of the, the study. So I gave an example of the loader earlier. This is where um, I'm doing the infection process of, of the device. And this was actually very useful to be able to cat in IP addresses and known credentials uh, of a, of a um, or to pipe in uh, IP addresses and known credentials of the, the box that I wanted to focus on. Um, what I'm showing here is um, that in the loader process, I start, nothing's logging in, nothing's logging in. Okay, now I've got one login. And if this were the overall loader process, I could see that I've got 20,000 logins here, you know. Uh, and I could see that right now I'm running one TFTP process. I'm running no wgets. But uh, what was interesting to me with this was that I had to do TFTP, which I didn't think about out of the box, or I didn't think about right away, because m the uh, busy box client that was running on the camera didn't include a wget uh, uh, binary or code. So ultimately, I had to do it with TFTP. Um, this is when, you, in the control of the bot, you can see um, I, I want to show you what is, I want to see what are my bots that are connected. We have um, one that is the Telnet um, MPSL, which is the, bio, the code for or the, the platform for this box. And then the, the colon one is just my CNC bot, right? So um, here's, a, here's the actual capture of that bot beginning its scanning process. And we can see. Uh, my IP is 192.168.3.140. He immediately starts um, scanning all of these random IPs. Um, and he's uh, mostly 23, but he's got 2323 here. Uh, I had these on a, on a Cisco switch. Um, and for all of these examples, I'm going to show port, average port bandwidth, because I thought that that was interesting to me. Uh, so here, the, in, the initial scans are doing just 80K of, of scans and 147 packets per second. So one other thing that was interesting when I, when I checked the bot, and you know, we've heard about in, in study of the code, is that Telnet, as you can see, is no longer enabled here. So the bot process is, is predatory, and it, and it tries to take over the bot, or it takes over the, the device that it's infecting. and. Um, <coughs> He shuts down Telnet so that nobody else can, can control it. Um, he is, uh, the, the code is, is running in memory, so if you flush it, it would all, if you reboot the device, it would be flushed and Telnet would open up again. But something else that is interesting here is SSH is enabled now. SSH uh, was not enabled um, in the initial port scan that I did and showed earlier. And this was interesting to me um, because why, you know, why is this running? I, I actually don't know. Um, I went back again today and checked. I can't SSH into the box. Maybe it's just an artifact of, <coughs> excuse me, of how the box is or how the camera is reacting to the loss of Telnet. I, I really don't know. I don't think that Mirai um, communicates over, over SSH at all. So it was just interesting. So we're going to go through the attack vectors here. Um, this is a screenshot of what the control looks like. So I do a question mark from the, from the botnet control. And I say, what are the available attacks here? And we're going to go through each of these and, and what they do. <coughs> uh, a UDP flood, uh, just a basic UDP flood. Um, this is interesting. It's a, a, a default random source IP and a default random destination IP. In my experience, a lot of the tools have been um, you know, maybe a, a, a common destination port or something. Oh, I'm sorry, I said random destination uh, IP. Random destination port, random source port. Uh, a lot of times the, the tools that are maybe from like the anonymous toolkit for 2016, they're, they're like Loic are, are using a common source or destination port, right? So uh, this is interesting. And it makes, it makes fingerprinting more dif uh, difficult, especially if you're doing firewall filters on routers or ACLs. So. 
a uh, little bit harder to, to handle, you know, if you're, if you're handling this on a router. Um, you can see it's almost two meg of, of traffic that's generated here. Not a, not a ton. We've seen uh, pretty good uh, UDP attacks. Um, this is, remember, this is just what's generated out of a camera, so it's not a ton of, of traffic. Uh, here's what it looks like. Each of these examples, I'll give a, um, a Wireshark uh, visual and then a, a TCP dump. That might be a little bit easier to see for the folks in the back. Um, but again, just an example of random source port, random destination port. Um, oh, and then it crashed. It crashed my camera. And this is actually reported by somebody else that I, that I was uh, chatting with as well. Uh, it, it only seemed to happen on this attack vector, but um, after running a UDP attack for a long time out of this camera and apparently some other cameras, uh, the, the device can't handle it, and it crashes, and it reboots, and then I lose Mirai. You know, so that's why that, that forced loader comes in handy as well. But it was just interesting that it crashes it. Um, here's a SIN flood. It's, a, again, random source port, random destination port. A pretty nice one-to-one -one correlation between uh, packets that are, you know, SINs that are sent and the acts that are returned. Um, 78 or 787 kilobits per second. Um, we've got a pretty good, you know, rate of, uh, of traffic coming back as well. Now, remember when these are uh, live production, these are going to be, you know, maybe 40,000, 100,000 bots, so real IP addresses that are, that are, that are doing these and, um, you know, the attack, the target that is being attacked is going to be responding to all of those random real IP addresses. Uh, here's an example of just what it looks like in, in Wireshark. Um, so we, we're, sen we're sending SINs. Um, the uh, host that's being attacked is sending a reset uh, and an ACK. Uh, ACK flood, um, basically same thing, random source, random destination. Again, a one-to-one -one correlation. We've got a little bit more uh, bandwidth uh, tied to this one too, about five meg of, of traffic that, it's able, that this one camera is able to generate. Uh, again, a one-to-one -one correlation for historical or for your own viewing of what you might want to look at when you're, if you're encountering this in your network. Uh, here's what it looks like from Wireshark. Um, this one is good, a stomp flood. So this is kind of a twist on the, on the uh, traditional ACK flood. Um, he doesn't begin the ACK flood until a session is established, which is, which is interesting. Um, so a session is set up. Uh, I receive a sequence number, everything's uh, working, you know, I've got an established flow, right? And then suddenly I start flooding the guy with Axe. Um, actually, my camera couldn't run this attack, so I had to run him from the Raspberry Pi. Um, that's why these are a little bit different uh, numbers and, 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 in fact, colors on the slide. But this guy got about 90 meg of, of traffic on the Pi's, I think the Pi has 100 meg ports. Uh, so not bad. Um, but what's interesting, as I say about this, is it's, a, it's, a, it's an evasion technique, perhaps, to try and evade some of the uh, defenses that we might have in the network for blocking just regular ACK floods or SYN floods. So once a session is established, then I start it with the, with the ACK flood. Uh, here's what it looks like in Wireshark. Um, also, um, notice that I'm sending uh, pushes here. So, so I set up my session, and then the attacking bot um, immediately starts with, I'm sending a push and an act, and I'm, and I'm trying to confuse the host. The push is, is his intention is to say, don't wait for everything else that you might be receiving from me. Just start processing. So, you know, just an interesting twist on it. Uh, here you can see examples of um, the difference, the sequence number that's being repeated. So um, it's just a, it's a, it's a uh, attempt to, as I say, bypass some of the security uh, features of some protection sets. Uh, UDP flood, uh, the, so just a basic, uh, this has less options. Oh, I'm, I didn't mention that all of these examples up here show the parameters with which you can tune an attack. So, you know, I give examples of UDP plane, the P that I want to attack, and then the time frame, the duration that I want to do, in this case, 120 seconds. And then I hit a question mark and see what are, just like in a CLI of a router, what are the other parameters that I can do here? Um, so um, the, UDP, the plain UDP flood, uh, it says that it has randomized destination ports. I only observed destination port 54005. 
Um, Wireshark decodes it as uh, Gigi uh, Vision Stream Protocol. Um, it's a pretty high, you can see 20 meg or so of, of traffic generated by the camera, so we're, we're, we're working our way up in terms of traffic that the camera can, can generate. This uh, you won't be able to see, but I wanted to include it for uh, posterity or maybe zooming in on, on video. Um, but here is basically what that looks like in TCP dump. Uh, a lot of these are packet length 512, so that might be a parameter that you might be able to filter on. Uh, destination port 54005. Um, I think that this is just a, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that every time it's 64446. This is a pretty good one. Um, so Valve Technologies or Valve Software has a, 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 a package, a software package that they call Source. And Source, I believe, is a, is a 3D um, modeling engine used for video gaming, right? So this is an attack that is specifically designed to, um, to attack gaming servers, right? So um, it's a UDP flood, a random source port. Um, destination port is 27015, which um, is the port that a lot of the, that this engine is running on, right? Um, it's used for Half-Life and Counter-Strike and those kind of things. So the payload, I'll show you, includes a, a query for this. Um, not a ton of bandwidth, 162K, maybe it's really 80K if, if we know that the scanner is running too. Um, but it's a, it's a targeted attack. Now, how are you going to find this or how would you combat this? Um, what I don't know, I don't have access to production, you know, data center data anymore. Um, but I would suspect that any gaming network is probably already running this traffic. So it's probably, you know, it's probably not something that you can just filter out 27015, um, because I think that that would probably break the games. Um, here's a, an example of the Wireshark capture. Uh, you can see the query that's uh, included in the payload here. Uh, and this is basically just uh, what it looks like on uh, the actual flood. So random source ports attacking UDP 27015. And again, I would think that if I was running a gaming network, uh, I would probably see a lot of this in my network already. So it might be a difficult thing to try and fingerprint and attack or d and block with you know, traditional uh, firewall filters or ACLs. So this guy is uh, the DNS attack, uh, which, so I said that I had uh, some experience with this um, in prior to joining Server Central, or prior, while at Server Central prior to joining um, Radware. Um, this is a pretty neat attack. Uh, I've got some additional info, a little more study on it. Um, the, uh, we launched the attack here in the code. Um, as always, all of the attacks are launched with attack name, um, IP address that I want to attack, and the destination. Uh, and then I add parameters to it. So here, um, I have DNS, I have the IP address, and I have the duration. Actually, what happens on this, only this attack, that IP address is ignored, it's not included. And, and it's because this is an attack on DNS resolvers. So um, here in my example, I've said DNS, I put in the IP address of my attacking server, the one that I usually attack, my duration, and I add a domain that I want to, uh, to use. This is just a unrouted domain that uh, I'm using and I'm serving uh, DNS for on, my, on that bind server. Uh, he's 187K or maybe 100K of, of, of attack traffic, but he floods the target DNS server. So he's flooding the authoritative DNS server, ultimately the authoritative DNS server for the domain here. We'll dig into this. Um, what's happening also is he's prepending or he's adding a 12 character string to uh, the, the front of whatever domain you put in that, that switch of domain equals. So in my case, what's interesting here is uh, the attack is coming from my DNS server. So the, the host that the camera is using for his DNS queries, which in my case was that Linksys because he, he's giving that out as part of his DHCP request or DS, DHCP um, fulfillment. Um, so the camera is asking the, the Linksys, hey, give, what do you know about random string dot, uh, domain dot com, right? So this is how it looks on the, on the DNS server. Um, I'm, I'm getting these attacks from a real legitimate DNS server. And in production, this is going to be 
real DNS servers. So how, you can't block requests from Comcast's resolvers, right? You don't want to do that, you know, or, or Verizon's resolvers. You can't do that. So this is a, this is a difficult one to, to try and fight. Um, it's small length, high packets per second. In, in my examples or in my history of, of working on this guy, he can be a pretty tough one. So you might see, you might see uh, 25 gig of, 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 of traffic in terms of uh, bits per second, but it might be you know, 50 million packets per second. So you might exhaust packets per second on your links before you're exa exhausting uh, bandwidth uh, utilization. Uh, this is a couple looks at what, what happens here. So uh, a lot of the examples are saying, um, you know, this is going to be added to just, you know, random string dot www dot domain dot com. But in fact, you might also see it as just random string dot domain dot com. It really, the only parameter is do I add uh, what I put in the domain string here. So again, this is the, the syntax that I'm using, target dot domain.com or domain.com, and uh, the result is always a 12-character random string that is prepended to the, to the query. Uh, this one is really cool. Uh, this uh, is the GRE IP flood. Um, he sends traffic that is encapsulated as, as GRE. Uh, the tunnel, when we look into the, the tunnel traffic, the source IP is always this uh, uh, unused or you know, special, special use uh, IP space. Uh, it's always this specific IP address. This is a high bit per second, high packet per second camera uh, attack, um, which you know initially when we heard about the GRE vectors being used in a lot of these Mirai attacks, a lot of us were thinking, why is GRE being used? Maybe it's being used to maybe tr as maybe a method to try and knock down cloud scrubbing centers that might be using GRE for delivery. And I never really thought that that was really it. But after doing this test, it dawned on me that. This is the highest packet per second attack that's out here, um, and the highest uh, volume uh, attack that was out here. So this is probably the most effective, in terms of volume, attack that is in the tool set here. So 25 meg in my example, um, pretty good. Uh, here's an example from Wireshark of, of the, the traffic. It immediately decodes it as the tunneled traffic. Um, but you can see in my example here is my source, my real source uh, IP, my real destination IP, and there's the tunneled traffic. Destination IP is random uh, in the tunneled payload, so interesting. Uh, and TCP dump version of it, here's, here's what you're seeing. This, I think, was also cool. Uh, I didn't really realize what this attack was until I looked at it, um, but uh, along the same lines of a GRE attack, this is uh, transparent Ethernet bridging over GRE. So here I'm, I'm jamming this with, um, with layer two traffic, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, it's not as high a throughput. It's about half of, a little bit less than half of what the, what the GRE IP attack is. Um, but again, here are the parameters uh, that I can add. I could just with these, with the same normal switches, uh, I, I can get the attack going. Um, <clears throat> but here are the, uh, here's the layer two information that's tunneled inside of it, which I, I thought was pretty cool. I don't really know the reason why this would be included, but maybe some of you do and could share. Um, and again, here's what the tunneled traffic looks like. Uh, this I thought was also cool. Uh, it's the HTTP attack uh, that is included with it. It is... Um, just a get slash attack, so it's a you know something that is not a a, uh, a new um, idea. Uh, but what's interesting about it is for me, I saw this generated um, about 500,000 uh, kilobits per second of um, of get requests, right? So what was interesting about that is actually the reverse. What the web server was returning back to the bot. So I've got a huge difference here in. I'm only doing 500k of, oops, sorry, only doing 500k of requests, but I'm getting 12 meg of, of return response here, which is, you know, when I'm doing this with a ton of bots, uh, uh, and you can see how this could easily exhaust resources. Uh, the content that I was serving here to get this 12 meg was just the basic it works page in, in Apache, right? So um, it's a pretty big thing. Uh, it's, it, it, it could be a pretty big attack for 
the host that it's attacking. Um, and uh, just some of the things that you'll see are incrementing source ports, which makes sense because I'm doing continual gets. Uh, this is what uh, it looks like decoded in, in uh, Wireshark. Again, you probably won't be able to see it maybe for future reference. Um, but it's just basically get slash, and I get an HD uh, 200 OK that I get back from the server, and I'm serving content. Um, Mirai has out of the box five different user agents, HTTP user agents in included. Uh, here are the examples of them. You'll be able to just find this in the code, but I thought that that was pretty cool to have uh, five different ones included. Um, so each of these attack vectors had a time parameter, if you remember. In most examples, it was 120 seconds that I've added in my examples. Um, but they can be as little as you know several seconds. Um, and that makes uh, a new challenge for us as network people. Um, you know, our traditional ways of finding some of these things, let's say you're Bitfinex here, who Bitfinex, these guys, um, if you remember, they had, a, they had a breach on their exchange. They're a Bitcoin, or yeah, they're the third largest Bitcoin exchange in the world, and they had about $72 million stolen from them. So here they're, you know, from the Mariah Tax uh, Twitter feed, they're obviously still under attack for things. Um, but 60 second, Floods, 30-second floods. That's a lot of what you'll see in the Mariah Tax uh, Twitter feed, which I would I would recommend looking at. Uh, and why that's interesting is, if I'm dealing with a 20-gig attack that lasts for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, that's what we call burst attacks. That's like kind of like gr gr uh, guerrilla warfare on our networks, right? Where they're hard to find. Um, they're not always going to show up on SNMP graphs. Um, they're going to really manifest themselves as either uh, output drops on switch ports or router ports, or angry users saying, my app is slow. Hey, network guys, fix the network. And then network guys are going to say, no, my graphs look fine. It's the app. Well, it could be one of these. So just keep your eye out for that. Make sure you have some tools that are able to catch some of this. Sample rate, um, uh, maybe adjusting your SNMP polling intervals, that kind of thing. But uh, it's very easily controlled here. And I would definitely check out that, uh, that Twitter feed. Uh, variations to the code. So I mentioned that this is highly customizable, um, and it's available for anybody to, to go ahead and do. <coughs> uh, this is not Radware research. This is uh, the link from where this was, uh, this was Security Week article, I think. Uh, but this article by December 9th found 53 unique versions of it. Um, we saw in my examples, in my out-of-the-box code, that we were at um, you know, TCP 23, so Telnet and 2323. But uh, our friends at Deutsche Telekom found that you know, they, were, they were the recipient of a modified version of this that was, uh, that was targeting TR069. So uh, tr obviously trying to try and, and attack different ports here. Uh, the domain generation algorithm I thought was a pretty neat addition. Uh, we see this in, in, in other, um, other versions of, of malware or attacks, um, but it's, uh, what was interesting here is that it has the ability, so so much of the control, the command and control, is obviously based on DNS. And if we can knock down DNS, um, we can potentially knock down the, con the command and control function. Um, but when you add a, a domain generation algorithm, the what the bot does is, if it can't meet, reach its primary CNC uh, connection, it will go into this process of trying a new randomly generated domain algorithm, or uh, randomly generated domain. So, and in this case, it switches every day. So it's interesting. Uh, Conficker was, uh, I think, as high as 50,000 uh, per day. So it's, uh, you know, one per day is, is uh, is, is progress, you might say, but uh, there are better examples. Uh, but it still is interesting, and, and you know, one method of how if, if we knock down the domain, uh, it can adapt. Sorry. This is an example of the, uh, the guys at 360. Uh, this, they are, uh, I believe that they're the ones who discovered this, but this is their example of, of how the domain algorithm in Mirai works. So, uh, you know, just a just a statement to how this thing can be easily modified and changed, and um, you know, really, with the code being available to all of us, we can we can do anything that we need it to do, right? 
So how can I catch this in my network? Um, out of the box, this is, these are the parameters, right? So un, unmodified command and control runs on Telnet. Um, that might be interesting to us because we're probably not seeing a lot of Telnet. Uh, we shouldn't see a lot of Telnet in our networks, I would think. Um, so that's one way. Uh, but as we see, the, it's modifiable. So I would suspect that it's not all variants of it are probably not uh, all running this uh, this way. Uh, replication scanning also was through Telnet and um, 2323. So keep a look out for that in your NetFlow. Um, scan listen, its default port runs on 48101. So watch out for that. Um, you might see that in NetFlow. Honeypots are a pretty neat way. We're going to talk about one example of a honeypot that I had, had played with a little bit. And there are, there are scanner uh, services out there on the network or on the internet that will look at, you know, you can put in your prefixes and they will check, hey, what's, what's vulnerable in your network. They'll basically try to scan your network for you. Uh, so Symmetria is, uh, they have a honeypot that I enjoyed uh, playing with. I think that it has a little bit, uh, it's still under development and more to do if you I would say try it, and if you like uh, what it's doing, um, maybe uh, consider uh, contributing to it. Uh, here's how I installed it uh, on Ubuntu. Uh, this is basically all it is. Um, this is the exact syntax. I'm getting it out of GitHub. Uh, I'm adding these, uh, these guys. I'm installing my requirements, and this is my, my launch uh, command to run it. And this is what it looks like, so you run it. And um, you know you can see this didn't take long here. I mean I think that this was two or three minutes, and I'm already having a, a, a guy trying to brute and, and execute commands that are identified as as Mirai uh, attacks. Uh, Mirai is not the only IoT botnet. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that one of my colleagues calls this the celebrity botnet, obviously because of what it did, but. Um, there are other ones here. Here's information to all of these. Um, so pay attention to them. As I say, Mirai's not the only guy out, not the only game in town. Um, but uh, if you need these links, I can get them to you as well. Uh, and then in, in closing, so people are arguing about the longevity of, of Mirai. You know, if you go into some of these uh, websites and, and ask for help or look around and try to get help, people are saying, Forget about it. Mirai is over. Maybe they're just tired of people coming up and asking questions. But, but people are saying, and whatever is infected is infected, and all you're going to get is the low-hanging fruit. Um, I don't really agree with that, because as we can see, and as we saw with the, with the DT uh, attack of, of trying to take over almost a million routers, code as it is now is flushed from the devices when the power is, is reset. So that means anything that is infected and then rebooted, unless it has been modified, is ultimately a target again. So I don't think that we're, I don't think that this is uh, over yet. And I don't think that new, it's, I don't think we're, I think we are going to see more variants uh, and more things being uh, taken advantage of. Um, it's a game changer. Um, just the ability for everybody to have access to this code um, and have clear, written instructions. This is really the first time I can think of that there are, everybody has access freely to the code, and there are how-to guides on the internet about how to set this up. Basically, everything you need to do to set this up, modify it, and uh, have your way with, with uh, the botnet. So, so as operators, we need to be mindful of, of what's happening in our equipment, uh, in our network. We have to be mindful of the equipment that we're deploying, we have to be mindful of our customers. Yesterday in the security talk, um, I talked about the growth and the, um, the take rate of IoT compared to users on the network. And it was a huge jump between now and estimated for 2020 about what was, I think it was going to be about 20 billion devices attached, IoT devices attached to the network by 2020. And the majority of that growth is in the consumer uh, base. So our users, who are not the technical people, right, and they're not going to be the ones who are caring about the security of these things. As operators, I think that we have a, a pretty important role in, in uh, policing this stuff. And I don't necessarily mean shutting people off, but maybe if you're seeing this in your network, 
and you're seeing something from an access link coming in from a subscriber, notify them, send them an email, maybe do some, you know, if they're, a, uh, if they're a, uh, an access subscriber, maybe do some steering to direct them to like a web page that says, hey, we've tried to contact you. Your service is, uh, uh, you're in part of a botnet, we're about to shut you off, that kind of thing. But I think it's important. Um, and we have to give thought to how we handle these attacks in our own network. Uh, I gave examples of, of how customizable these attack vectors are, um, how easily, you know, a lot of them are different than what we've seen in the traditional HOIC and LOIC and uh, a lot of the, ex the traditional tools that are, are used for attacks against our own network. A lot of them, as I say, random source port, random destination port, a lot of them are legitimate traffic, like the DNS queries from legitimate DNS servers. Um, a lot of them are legitimate, like you don't want to block all of the, the Valve source engine traffic if, if you're a game network that might use this. So how are you going to, block? you have to give thought to how you're going to differentiate between the good traffic and the bad traffic, and it's, a, it, it's going to be a challenge. So. Uh, and with that, I'd like to open it up to questions or feedback or comments or suggestions of anybody else who might have some experience in this. Hello, uh, Phil Rosenthal from Beluga CDN and IS Prime. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, so my, my, my question is, why is there such a large difference in the amount of traffic that it can generate between these different attacks? Like, is, is it inefficiency in the, the different vectors, or are they limiting it? Um, that's a good question. Thanks, Phil. I, uh, from what I see, I would guess that it's probably the the task that is required on these low power devices to generate the traffic, right? So it could be that um, the, my camera, which is a couple years old, um, is requiring more CPU to, to generate the output of whatever the attack vector is uh, on one attack vector versus the other. So I don't know that they're limited. I did see somebody in response to, if you remember, my UDP flood rebooted the camera. Somebody said, well, what you want to do is limit the, you know, the attack vector that's coming out of that. And other people say, well, you can't really, you don't know what every, the capabilities of every single device are going to be, so that might not be a good uh, option. I think it's really just the function of generating the traffic, and just as you might have the same response on a small Pentium versus a, you know, an eight-core proce modern processor. And, uh, another, I guess, related question. So if you own one of these cameras, would you start noticing that like there's something wrong with, with your camera if it was infected? It's a good question, and I don't know because I didn't really set it up to look at, um, like am I losing my data feed? I might not. I think I would probably, you know, if, if it's tied to CPU resources, I would think that um, I would probably maybe have some issues with my video stream, but I, I didn't look at it personally, but I, I would bet you would. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well thank you. I will be um, around uh, only for the rest of today. Uh, unfortunately, I have to, to go to another event tomorrow, but uh, we'll be at the Beer and Gear tonight as well, so look forward to talking with you. Thank you.